I got it from a tree outside. Tastes like dead people. That's not funny, Roy. <laughs> no, but... It's quite funny. It's surprisingly delicious. Am I going to hell for laughing at that? <laughs> Give me a minute. <laughs> but is it... <laughs> Trying to be serious, be serious, be serious, Dr. Carthy. This is going to be the last video looking at clips from season two of Ted Lasso. So much good mental health stuff to talk about, particularly thinking about how does therapy start to end in a way that hopefully empowers us rather than hurts us. I love this show so much. Ready? Let's crack on. Roy, if you die, do you want to be buried or cremated? Like if you were hit by a bus today, what do I do? Go after the bus driver and make him pay for what he did to me. <laughs> <laughs> Avenge me, Keely. Avenge me! This funeral is really messing with your head, isn't it? I found this company, and they bury you in a biodegradable sack. So Brilliant. when your body decomposes, it fertilises the seeds of a fruit tree. That's what I want. Because then you and all the people that love me can eat the fruit from my tree. <laughs> what do we think Roy Keane would say about that? Sorry, Roy Kent. Definitely not the same person. In all seriousness, though, funerals tend to make you come face to face with the inevitability and the unpredictability of death. I'm not going to talk about grief any more than that because I've talked about it to death when I watched Scrubs and on some of the episodes of The Last of Us as well. So check those out if you want to know more about my strong opinions about the over medicalization of grief. Just like the idea that my death can nourish people. With fruit made from your rotting corpse. I wouldn't eat that. But you'll eat a kebab that you find a hair in. It's fine if you know who the hair is from. That's part of the deal. He's a lovely bloke. <laughs> something, something psychodynamic about living vicariously through a tree. Something, something Carl Jung. That'll do. So this is the onset of a panic attack. This escalated very quickly. And this is the time to try and use those grounding techniques that tries to take your attention away from the catastrophic thoughts and the physical sensations of a panic attack that could be really frightening and just fuel the panic attack. And onto a tangible alternative. Focus on your breathing. Focus on something you can see in the distance. Focus on something sensory, like the feeling of your feet on the ground or putting your hands in cold water. This is the really difficult thing with the panic attacks. Spotting those early warning signs that it's coming to be able to do those grounding techniques before the fight and flight response basically takes over all logic and reasoning. Oh, what a chubby baby. Congratulations, Mother. You've just fat shamed a baby to tears. To start them young with the low self esteem alongside the emotionally stifled and passive aggressive relationships oh. that these little have together. Et voila. Mm. Magic touch. Oh, it's not magic. I ate the placenta raw. Chino. Ah. Ah. <laughs> Please don't eat raw placenta and get group B strep. Just. Eat some toast. I mean, I know like white toast and salted butter is something that might kill Gwyneth Paltrow, but for most people, it tastes really nice. And to be honest, it's better for you than eating raw placenta. Okay. Ted, you're... Ted, you're okay. Just breathe. Just focus on your four, seven, eight, breathe. So she's trying to reassure him. You can, come on. Just breathe. I'm on my way challenge the catastrophization and 478 breathing is an example of one of those grounding techniques. Four seconds of breathing in, hold it for seven seconds, exhale for eight seconds. One, it's a grounding technique, so it just takes your attention onto counting and focusing on the, the sensation of your breath, but also it reduces the hyperventilation as part of a panic attack that then blows up all the carbon dioxide, makes us feel dizzy, causes the tingling in our fingers, and just makes the whole thing scarier that fuels the panic attack even more. I got it from a tree outside. Tastes like dead people. That's not funny, Roy. <laughs> no, but... It's quite funny. It's surprisingly delicious. Am I going to hell for laughing at that? <laughs> Give me a minute. <laughs> but is it... <laughs> Trying to be serious, be serious, be serious, Dr. Carthy. It's not about the rotting corpse tree, though, is it? It's about her feelings of anxiety over death. And the question is, why? Is it over the uncertainty about when it's going to happen, so the unpredictability as well? Is it about feeling unfulfilled or that you haven't achieved the goals that you wanted to by this point in life? That's the interesting bit to delve into. That was funny, though. You want something to drink? A cup of tea or something? No, thank you. I hate tea. Tastes like a wet paper bag. Uh, well, you're wrong. Love tea. Oh, great. I'll tell you anything. He got up and she sat down. It was turning into a session and it was clearly all a bit much. Um, and he was still maybe building himself up and was a bit uncomfortable. But 
the real sign of progress for Ted is that he didn't run away. He was feeling it. He managed it at his pace. She let him feel it and let him manage it at his pace, not at her pace. It's good. It's not surprising that you had a panic attack. It's possible that going to this funeral would trigger memories of going to your own father's funeral. True. Mm. Nope, nope, nope. I didn't go to my dad's funeral. Even okay, more interesting. Because he quit. You know, he quit on his family. He quit on himself. And I hated him for that. Well, maybe still hates him. I think I still hate him for it. Yeah. I remember why Ted came back and sort of stuck with the therapy because he doesn't quit. It's one hell of a revelation and a light bulb moment because, you know, most people would feel guilty for harboring those feelings of hatred towards someone that was also clearly struggling to have felt so backed into a corner as to take his own life. But Ted's feelings of anger are really valid. So it might sound a bit dark and twisted me saying this, but given that we are where we are, I'm really happy for him that he's got to this point. Therapy is about clarity, not necessarily about feeling better, at least immediately. I think you do too, Ted. And that's okay. And that's okay. What happened with your father age. is a difficult thing for anyone to make sense of, especially his teenage son. And hard to understand for his adult son, clearly. Do you agree? Yeah, okay. Okay, good. Why don't you share with me what happened? And this is a great example of how to create a feeling of safety in that relationship because she's validating, she's not judging, she's sticking with him, she's meeting him at the feelings rather than saying, here's how we try and avoid those feelings so you don't feel as bad. You need to feel what you need to feel. And the do you agree is good because it finds common ground to build upon, but also gives an invitation to say, no, I don't agree. So I, you know, came home from school as usual and I... Went up to my room to... Nick a bottle of wine from your drinks cabinet. And as we opened the door, I heard... Bang! So we went to investigate. I opened up the door and... There it was. Their secure attachment's doing something so painful that feels like a betrayal. And then to be a kid or a teenager, to be in the house when you lose a parent, either you lost respect for your parent or you've lost their life entirely. I mean, I can only imagine. I've unfortunately seen too many cases of teenagers who've been the ones to find parents and start resuscitating parents after a suicide attempt. And it both amazes me that they have done it and it breaks my heart at the same time. I'm curious about something. What was he like? Excellent question. He was a good man, you know. Real chatterbox, believe it or not. Probably could have been a little bit better listening box at times. <laughs> what did you love about him? Mm, another great question. Why? So this is an effort to try and reframe his perception of his dad and who he was as a person. Someone who, yes, did something really hurtful to him, but also did many things that were incredibly loving. Next morning I wake up and he says, hey, you ain't gonna ride your bike to school, I'm gonna drive you. I'm all right. And on the way to school, he talks me through the entire book, like it's a uh, bedtime story or something. Because he stayed up all night, the whole night, reading the whole damn thing. Because he didn't want his little boy stressed out over some stupid, silly test. <laughs> and I ended up getting an A. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> He was a good dad. Our memories have a tendency to be unreliable, particularly when it comes to very emotional events in our life. We are more likely to recall factual events that are in keeping with that emotion. If we predominantly label something as negative, we're more not likely to remember all the negative aspects of it when we know actually nearly everything in life is full of shades of grey, even if the negatives really did outweigh the positives. So she's just encouraging him to step back and think more broadly about who his dad was, but without invalidating the anger that he feels. I don't think he knew that. So he feels guilty, maybe, for, tell for not telling him. I think he would have known how good he was at stuff he didn't really care about being good at. He... I don't think he would have done it. He 
he's holding himself responsible to some degree for his dad's death. And I wish I would have told him. I wish I would have told him more. And just look at how little the therapist is saying, this is great, she's providing safety, space, containment, but not problem solving. Thank you, Ted. I don't know if this is illegal or something, but can I have a hug? Sure. Well done for asking. I want to hug him, which is an interesting counter-transference in and of itself because it makes me think about, well, who does he wish he was really hugging right now? I hate to be the bearer of bad news, Ted, but Sharon's already gone. I beg to differ, Higgy Stardust. Sharon's last day is manana. Yes, but an emergency came up and she has to leave tonight. She should know better than to allow an abrupt Wait, ending like this. saying goodbye? Uh, she wrote everybody a letter. Um, mine was very nice. Not going to cut it. Here's yours. Not going to cut it on its own. No. Endings are planned in advance because they can evoke a lot of emotions. You've shared uh, emotionally intimate moments. You've built trust. And when it ends, for many people, it can kind of replay past histories of when people that you've trusted and that you've allowed yourself to be emotionally vulnerable with always end up leaving you. It perpetuates this core belief that everybody leaves. Now, therapy will stop at some point, but you need to plan it in advance and build up to it. So it's predictable. So the question is, how much is Sharon actually avoiding having to deal with this? Like avoiding a breakup and just ghosting people and hope that that'll be it. Sorry, I'm not good with goodbyes. Yeah, well, when I was a baby, I wasn't good at walking and talking, but I just stuck with it and look at me now. Oh, uh, uh, with Ted. Did you get my letter? Yes. Did you read it? No. I mean, we had a whole thing planned for you. You know how hard it is to get grown men to learn choreography? If you don't think you're good at goodbyes, well, then get better at them. That's the job. You're the professional in this. You don't get to avoid. I mean, my wife left me, my dad left me. You, more than anyone in the world, knows how I feel when I get abandoned. And you just left. He's been quite insightful. I about that. It's all in the letter I left for you. The letter. The, the, OK. You mean this? This right here? Guess what? I'm not going to read your letter. Ever. But now he's being a bit childish and acting out by rejecting her first by not reading the letter. Or it's trying to maybe end things on his terms and give himself the illusion of control. What do we think he's feeling at the moment? I mean, these ending letters are great, but you have to do it in conjunction with an in-person goodbye. Very good, lad. I'm left wondering if he's feeling maybe, maybe that he's been seen and understood by someone, maybe better than he sees and understands himself. Who knows her way around a pinball machine? Huh? <laughs> I love pinball. Yeah. It's one of the most entertaining forms of meditation. The only opponent is yourself and gravity. <sighs> yep, two things we're stuck I mean, with. It kind of makes sense. I've never known pinball to be used for mindfulness, but, but yeah, I kind of see where she's coming from. <laughs> yeah, mindfulness is the ability to be fully present and aware of where we are, what we're doing, um, so that we're not overly reactive or overwhelmed by different situations, or less likely to be, I should say. And it involves doing activities that take our concentration and our attention away from things that are distracting, including our ruminating thought patterns. Take it away from there and onto the present. <laughs> <laughs> Son of a bitch stole my moon. Nice little token gesture of his progress and recovery. Here's one with no shit in it. <laughs> These ending letters, so both the one that Sharon wrote for him and another one that Ted's written for her, even if it's just one word, they can act sometimes as like these transitional objects, something physical from that relationship that you can hold on to and you can look back at and helps you ease from that journey through therapy and on to whatever the next chapter may be. The fact that a panic attack is newsworthy is a sad state of affairs, really. But it, in football, it is still. And then there's the betrayal of someone close to you. This really is a true reflection of how behind the dialogue is about mental health, particularly in football, but it's getting better. Come on now, George, be compassionate. Oh, come on, come on, Jeff. Come on, would, would uh, Bill Shankly have a panic attack? Eh? Would Brian Clough, would Alex Ferguson have a panic oh, attack? Of course he, fair. No, of course he wouldn't. Look, if, if your ship's being attacked, right, and you run to the bridge, you want to find a captain whose brain works, not some big girl's blouse. 
Fergie wouldn't have had a panic attack, he just throws a hairdryer at someone, commits an act of assault. Or the old guard would just sedate their emotions with alcohol, which of course is much better. You made me feel like I was the most important person in the whole world. And then you abandoned me. Like you switched out of life just like that. And I, I worked my ass off trying to get your attention back, to prove myself to you, to make you like me again. But the more, the more I did, the less you cared. It's like I was f***ing invisible. I haven't even got the, the photo I gave you for Christmas up in your office, just a picture of dumb Americans. But the anger he's displaying towards Ted almost mirrors the anger that Ted was talking about towards his dad from before, doesn't it? It's there masking a huge amount of jealousy and hurt and other forms of pain that are otherwise intolerable to feel and it's just easier to mask them with provocation and anger. Nate's gone from being someone that's been underestimated to being believed in and that's then given him hope for the future. I've said on previous videos, hope can be motivating but it can also be really provocative. So while it gives you uh, something to motivate you to continue, it also now gives you something to lose. Easy now, easy, get, hey, hey, y'all, come on, calm down, all right? Look, um, well, Right at the cricket bat here, I want to address the article written by our good friend, Mr. Trent Krim, from the... Or rather, I want to share with you all the truth about my recent struggles with anxiety. And, well, my overall concern about the way we discuss and deal with mental health in athletics. Football's behind in the way that we talk about mental health. It's not the only part of our culture that is behind, but it is certainly one of them. And football has this global influence. And I would say that this show, this fictional show, has done more for pushing that mental health conversation through football than anything that's happened from actually within the game itself. And the influence that that has on people is, it's immeasurable. Not only is this show wonderfully written and the acting is fantastic and it's really funny, it's probably saved some lives. Love it. And I know season three is out. I will get there. Be patient, be patient, be patient. Let me know what you thought. Let me know which clips from this whole season have really connected with you. And I will see you for another video very, very soon. Love you. Bye.